welcome from Dr. Switzerland. I have an echo. I can hear myself. Um, okay, now it's fine. So I'm going to present my slides, which ho hopefully will move now, yes. So this is the agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk about past and present of photo safety regulations, then stepwise photo safety strategies. Um, the question the dose makes the poison, why dynamic ranges of toxicity tests are important, and finally safety margins for potentially phototoxic drugs. So next slide. Why do we have to do it? This question up front and just one introductory slide to the topic. It's not gonna be a lecture on photobiology, but I think this is important to have in mind. It's about sunlight and the sunlight comes from the sun through the atmosphere, reaches um, the surface of the earth and then also the surface of the skin and penetrates into skin. And you see that the, the way it goes through depends on the wavelength. UVC is blocked at the ozone layer, UVB reaches the skin and UVA invisible light goes um, even through the epidermis and reaches the capillary blood. So it's important that the light and the drug, which might be phototoxic, are going to meet in the skin. And this depends on how much the wavelengths penetrate into the skin or how much the drug is penetrating from the blood system or an oral drug into certain skin layers. So keep this in mind when talking about um, further on photo safety. Now past and present of photo safety regulations. This talk is about ICHS-10. What happened before? So until 2009, there were regional guidances um, in Europe and from the FDA in the US. And there, were, there was one OECD test guideline, which is 432 on in vitro photoxid testing. In 2009, then a revision of ICH M3 added a section photo safety, which then uh, led to the uh, proposal to have a dedicated guidance on photo safety to further uh, detail the requirements for photo safety. This happened from 2010 to 2013. And since then, ICH is then is um, final and valid and has been implemented. Recently, a number of OECD guidelines also changed. The OECD 432 got an update. We have seen new guidances on um, reactive oxygen species and human skin models for phototoxicity. Um, now the status of ICH is 10 today. This is from the uh, homepage. And um, just a second. This is from the homepage uh, of ICH and you see the status. Um, it has reached step five many years ago. Um, and the countries on the right hand side have implemented it, including Korea, which is highlighted here, which was pretty fast. It was in 2014. So what agencies expect from companies actually? A very high level um, statement based on M3 and S10. Before entering late stage clinical trials, so this means before entering phase three clinical trials, there must be some way of photo safety evaluation. And if this ha has not been completed, there must be protective measures in clinical trials. For late stage clinical trials, so phase three or also for marketing authorization, this evaluation needs to be completed. So there must be a final statement. And if the fin final statement concludes that the risk cannot be neglected, you have to do a risk benefit assessment, including for toxicity, and you have to have instructions and you have to communi communicate the risk. This has, of course, impact on development and marketing. Um, if you learn late about this, I have an echo here, just a second. So um, if you learn, learn late about uh, photographic properties, for instance, only during a phase three trial, suddenly um, it's very late. You have lost years and dollars and one 
um, there's not no way to quickly change to another drug candidate. This is painful. Uh, marketing will be difficult with such a drug. The protective measures might be in place even for marketing and competitor drugs without such a label will have a commercial advantage. So selecting the right drug much earlier than in the clinic is key to avoid these um, late failures. And typically these assessments are done prior to GLP studies or at least during GLP studies prior to first clinical trials. So how does this now work? This is just a snapshot from ICHS10, how it was published in 2013. This doesn't look really appealing, that a very technical flowchart. There is a lot of legal language in the background. It's a, it's a result of a lot of discussions in the expert working group. But important is that it's a stepwise strategy already. So you first look at your UV spectrum. If this spectrum warrants further testing, which means the molar extinction coefficient is above 1,000, you go to the lower end. And they have a variety of options in vitro or in vivo or clinical evaluation, maybe tissue distribution, but this is not really uh, helpful. So you have an option what to choose. But again, this is typically a stepwise process. You rather do in vitro first before you would be able to do clinical evaluation. There is a footnote to this paragraph, uh, to this flowchart, and you may want to have a look, a close look later to this, uh, to these footnotes, which are shown on the right hand side. It clearly says how to overrule actually a positive in vitro. So this is a basis for actually how companies are doing this currently. I think in most cases, most companies doing this this way. So you start early with the UVVIS absorption spectrum. If this is below 1000, you're done. If it's above, you do an in vitro test. If this is negative, you're done. And this is true for actually 70% of uh, all your drug candidates on average. So for 70%, you can conclude no relevant human risk based on spectrum or in vitro test. For the other 30%, your in vitro test may indicate a weak response. And this is just um, a rule of thumb here. Typically, a little bit above five, a PIF of five would indicate there is a need to follow up in vivo, but you wouldn't be concerned too much. If it's much higher, especially if it's uh, well above 100, you would rather do this very early because this could be a troublemaker, a compound which is not going successfully through clinical development. So very quick look on what has been mentioned here, UVV spectra, this is very basic uh, FISCAM properties. You do a, um, a sample in a, in a spectrophotometer, you get the spectrum on the right hand side. You look for the highest value in sunlight range, which is 290 to 700. You calculate your molar extinction coefficient and you go from there. This is how the in vitro test looks actually. It's done in 90. Six well plates, you see clearly uh, dose dependent toxicity on the radiation. If it happens on the right hand side, the color disappeared actually, the neutral red staining. This was a phototoxic response on day three. And if you get IC50 values on the radiation and without irradiation, and you see this shift actually from unirradiated on the right hand side to irradiated on the left hand side. The stronger this shift to the left is, the stronger the effect is. And you can calculate your PIF, the photo irritation factor, based on these two IC50s. If it's below five, the guideline, the OSD guideline says it's negative. If it's above and you have a stable system and you know how to interpret this data in your hands, you can look at it and make an informed decision how to follow up uh, very quickly or maybe later because it's not too too dramatic. One way to follow up is an in vivo test. Um, there are several in vivo systems um, in mice, in rats, for instance. This is an example from what is done at Novartis and it has been published. The reference is below. Um, it's stored in three days and on each day um, irradiating at the T max uh, time point for around 30 minutes with a dose of 10 joules of um, UVA, 
And you can look at these mice um, each day. You look at edema. At, at necropsy, you can look at um, edema, ear weight, and other endpoints. So this is a quite informative short study to evaluate um, a potential product at risk in animals. And this is how it looks actually. So this is a RECIMA score on the left-hand side. And on the bottom, you see day one, day two, and day three. So this is how erythema develops over time. With our positive controls, bafloxacin, a fluoroquinolone antibiotic uh, at 25 milligram per kilogram, there's nothing. But if you dose 100, you clearly see how the score goes up already on the first day after irradiation. It goes to score two and later it goes to, day on, to score three on the last day. If you dose even higher, this score is already reached on the second day. So this is a very nice dose and time dependent erythema reaction. And you can also define the threshold of 100 where this positive control is positive. If you look at also at more sophisticated endpoints, for instance, ear weight, which is edema, swelling, or lymph nodes, you clearly see um, how this is in a um, dose and radiation dependent manner increasing. So now it's at necropsy, it's um, the three dose levels on the bottom, and you see how this comes up at 100 and 400, uh, 25 is negative. And there is a, a slight response already on the, on the ear weight and on the lymph nodes. You can see this is just a, a barely positive response here. If you compare these results um, in vitro to in vivo, this is quite interesting. This is one of the rare cases where in vitro actually predicts an in vivo toxicity outcome. Um, so if you put the PIF values from the in vitro test into categories, like it's shown on the upper right-hand side, um, as I mentioned, two thirds are negative, are below five, and then you have one third, which is being positive, up to 100 and above. And on the lower right-hand side, you see the number of animal studies we could compare, and all animal studies in our lab, which we could publish at that time, 34 animal studies, for compounds up to a PIF of 25 state negative. And for compounds which are more prototoxic in vitro, um, you could see how, how the positivity in animals increased. So for compounds about 100, PIF of 100, nine out of 10 studies were positive. So clearly the PIF value predicted the likelihood of an in vivo positive outcome. This is quite interesting because you can definitely use the PIF value to, um, to decide when and how urgently you would have to follow up or maybe even um, move immediately to a different compound because you don't want to even run an animal study with a PIF of 600, for instance. This is a figure which I'm not gonna explain, but I wanted to raise awareness. This is in the paper mentioned, published in 2014, a more detailed analysis on those groups for a number of uh, animal studies, so for 34 animal studies, and the positivity actually, depending on the PIF value. So now to clinical photoxicity testing. If you have a need to do clinical testing, which is typically after an, a more or less positive animal study, and you still try to, to develop this compound, this may happen that you make the decision and there is no clear guidance on how to run a clinical test. There are a few publications, there are a few protocols. Um, and a while ago, um, we published a clinical trial we had to do, and it was agreed uh, between several health authorities, including the FDA and Novartis, that this protocol would be acceptable if we do it. So we did it and we finally published it. Um, this is a concept developed by the um, University of Dundee, for instance, and um, other labs also in the United States. It goes down to the photosensitivity index, which is the minimal erythema dose, or the minimal dose which is causing an, a faint red erythema on the skin. Um, the dose means uh, light dose, or so UV dose, on a certain patient. So the baseline uh, dose is taken by each patient, and it, this baseline dose is moved by a drug, so it gets more sensitive. You need less UV to already induce an erythema. You can calculate the same ratio like for in vitro. 
for each patient. So the photosensitivity index is per patient. And it clearly indicates that this patient has a more sensitive, photosensitive skin because of the drug he was taking. So typically, you do this at steady state. So you have groups of um, drug at steady state, a placebo group, and maybe a positive control group if this is still necessary. And you can look at other endpoints, but this is the style design. And this is just an example here. Um, on the right hand side, you see the photo, um, photo um, irritation index. Uh, it's one, which means there was no change. And on the lower hand, you see the development after irradiation. So 10 minutes, one hour after irradiation, and a couple of days. And you see cyprofloxacin, the positive control used in the study, another fluoroquinolone antibiotic. Um, one hour after uh, irradiation, there was nothing, but 24 hours, it was clearly um, increased. So these patients were all more sensitive to light uh, 24 hours after, the, uh, after irradiation. Um, it was seen and then declined the erythema. The, the drug and the placebo did not change this, this parameter. So this was uh, good for the positive control, but also good for the investigational drug, which was tested here. During this uh, uh, trial, you can also look at um, things like um, full range UVB, UVA, or a mix of UVB and UVA. Um, what was shown here on the right hand side is um, UVA only, actually, as an example. So to my last major topic here of that, um, presentation. This is about safety margins, which is quite an important point. It's mentioned in ICH is 10, but it's important that this is also um, going into, uh, into daily routine, because before ICH is 10, there were hardly examples for using safety margins for phototoxicity. It was rather seen like an event like ingenotoxicity or contact allergy. If there was a hazard, it was positive, and that's that's the end, kind of. This was the perception. But full toxicity is like any other toxicity, and you can use no IAL levels, you can exposures, and you can calculate margins. So I have actually two examples here, and also a way to look at it. This example case is Pradigastat, an investigational drug uh, Novartis was developing a few years ago. This is the same publication, like I mentioned before, for the clinical trial. We had to run this clinical trial for this compound. So initially, there was um, a spectrum which showed absorption. Then there was in vitro test, and the PIF value was 56, limited by solubility, but it was at least 56. So clearly positive. We did initially um, an in vivo study, an oral photolog lymph node assay, up to 500 milligram per kilogram, and it was negative. And we felt this is enough. Uh, this was well above the clinical expected exposure. But when developing Pradigastat in the clinic, we realized the exposure is much higher than expected. And it, it's well tolerated by the patients. So the uh, margins actually went down significantly. And the regulators insisted on following up um, either in vivo or clinically. And we said we could do a new in vivo study with higher dose levels. So we went up to 1,000 and 2,000 milligram per kilogram. And we had bad luck. It turned to be positive at 1,000. So we had an animal study which had the same no IL as before. And we had to conduct a clinical study then. It was a study shown on the previous slides. And we calculated the steady state exposure in patients versus the CMAX exposure at our no IL in animals. And this was 15 fold. And we went back to the FDA and, and told her that we believe the clinical study was negative and we have a 15 fold margin now based on the animal study. And this taken together would uh, allow to lift any um, protective measures and avoid a label later. And the FDA agreed. So, this was accepted by the FDA, and we could move on. This is another example case. It's also published. Um, it's actually from our competitor here in Basel. It's from Hoffmann-La Roche. And they developed an oncology drug for 
a BRAF kinase inhibitor. Um, it's now sold as Selberaf. And initially, they saw it's phototoxic in the gene. This was um, apparent, but an animal study was negative. So they were um, convinced this is uh, not relevant for patients. But during the first clinical trials in oncology patients, um, 50% of roughly of these patients developed skin reactions. And these skin reactions were clearly phototoxicity skin reactions. Um, so they were significantly surprised that this happened in the clinic, although they felt the in vivo study was negative. We, we were also concerned this time, and this was when ICHS10 was developed. So the whole expert working group was concerned about that case. Internally at Novartis, we used our in-house model, uh, the oral photo LNA, and just tried the commercial um, uh, vimorafinib preparation, the Zelbraf tablets, in our animals. And we could actually show that it's positive in our animals, um, and that there was um, not much of a safety margin, actually. Um, the reason why it was initially negative in the Roche study was they used a different light source, a light source which was not uh, any more compliant with ICHS10, it was a narrow um, spectrum use instead of a full sunlight spectrum. And this was the reason why it was finally um, a negative, which was a false negative in vivo. So in our end, it was positive. So now if you look at safety margins, this is an illustration um, how this looks. On the left-hand side, the positive compound, the morafinib, I just mentioned. And you see the different exposure levels on the left-hand side. Um, the clinical efficacious dose level at 60 microgram per milliliters. The NOAL in our mouse study for that compound, which is just the same number, it's 55 here. And the clinical exposure um, is the same. So the factor would be one, and the safety margin of one. And the next higher dose was positive in our, in our mice. It was 190. So the clinic exposure was exactly between no AL and the first positive dose level in our animals. So with that situation, there was clearly no margin. It was not a surprise that this could be clinically relevant. On the right-hand side, you see the same with a 15-fold margin. So clinic exposure is 15-fold lower than no AL. And in that case, the patients did not develop any uh, skin reactions, which would point to full toxicity. So this is an uh, a nice summary on um, safety margins. And it's important that photo safety can be uh, evaluated uh, based on, on exposure and margins, actually, if you have designed your animal study correctly. And that's important here. The animal study needs to follow, actually, rules which are common for general tox studies. So you need to have uh, at least three dose levels to see a dose dependency up to MTD. This is based on M3 and S10. Um, repeat dose designed to reach uh, relevant exposure levels to have something like a steady state. And you have to have exposure from these animals. So you have to know Cmax and Tmax to, to finally be able to calculate margins. So, and now the last thing, um, there was recently a publication um, by these colleagues here from different companies this was actually published in September this, this year, just a couple of weeks ago. And it was a cross-industry survey on photo safety evaluation of pharmaceuticals after implementation of ICH S10. So what was done? Um, the industry organization, FPR and IQ TrueSafe in the US um, decided to run actually an online survey among all members of both uh, industry associations uh, to see how ICHS10 is, is handled internally by the companies and which exper ex uh, experience they made with the regulators. And this was done uh, 2018, uh, analyzed in 2019, and then the decision was made to publish it, which, which then finally happened last um, this year. And this is, uh, one slide on the, the whole paper, the summary. So uh, a total of 27 companies responded. It was a very detailed survey. Um, so dozens of questions actually categorized uh, into things like in vitro testing, neuro testing, clinical testing, um, 
differences in different regions. So the response was that um, most participant companies indicate a successful adoption of S10. So internally, but also with regulators, they said, it is actually working like described in the guideline. And there were no relevant regional differences, which is very important for ICH, because the purpose is to have a globally harmonized guideline, which is not leading to regional differences. Then there was a focus on the in vitro testing. So an OECD test guideline 432. S10 included a few modifications to this OECD test guideline, and companies said they, they applied the modification and it worked successfully. However, the other test mentioned in ICH S10, now we have an OECD guideline for that one, it's the ROS assay, reactive oxygen species. Um, it was rarely used, and many said they tried it or they concern, are concerned about the high positivity rate. So this was not really a success story yet, and we will see whether this is changing with the new OECD guideline. Then there was a strong focus on vivo testing because there is no guideline, no OECD guideline for in vivo photoxicity testing. So everything is based actually on ICHS10 and publications and experience. So typically uh, rodents are used, uh, most often the long Evans rats model, but also by T as I saw in my slides. Uh, it's common practice to use three dose levels up to MTD. Look at skin and eyes. Um, typically use 10 joules per centimeter squared of UVA, um, but full range sunlight actually. And then looking at skin for erythema and edema and to the eye histopathologically when in the case where it's warranted. Um, interestingly, there was only very limited feedback uh, on dedicated clinical photoxicity testing. Um, and as I said, initially, if you have to do it, it's late. It's as early as in parallel to phase two clinical trials. It's expensive. Um, and if, if it's positive, it, if it's showing a clinical risk, um, it's too late to change actually. So companies learned this and made this not a strategic option to do clinical testing as part of their strategy. There was also focus on safety margins. And a number of com um, companies um, mentioned that they successfully used margin of safety approaches to, uh, to progress with compounds which were positive in vitro, um, but showed a sufficient margin in animals. And this was accepted by health authorities, typically with a margin of um, 10 to 50 fold. Uh, but in one case, it was already uh, only five to 10 fold, which was then accepted apparently. So this also, confirms that safety margins uh, are an important point of the, the strategy um, and how to further develop compounds which are not fully negative in vitro. So let's come to the summary uh, of this presentation. So what are the properties of systemically applied pharmaceuticals? And my talk was today only about systemically applied. Um, maybe the cause of serious adverse drug reactions um, despite being clinically manageable in principle, they can limit the use of a drug depending on the indication. Um, protective measures against sunlight can be applied maybe for a few days if you have, for instance, an antibiotic um, and you get told as a patient that you should avoid sun, that's fine. But for chronic treatments or for cancer patients, which, which um, depend on maybe not a long lifespan, but want to enjoy the life, the quality of life during the time, that's not acceptable, neither for patients nor for regulators, actually. So ICHS 10 now provides guidance how to how a potential for electricity risk should be addressed during drug development, and it offers a tiered approach, which is very important. Remember, phototoxic is not like genotoxic or contact allergen. This is not a negative or positive call. Rather, you can think in terms of safety margins uh, to support human risk assessment based on CMAX. So it's not AUC, it's clearly CMAX, and you would calculate from OIL and animals for clinical efficacious those levels. And industry experience actually more than five years after ICHS 10 implementation indicates successful adoption by sponsors and regulators globally. And with that, I just want to mention uh, a number of people 
will help me and um, the industry uh, on preparing the talk. Actually, this talk is based on more than 10 years work. Um, colleagues from, from the guideline development, especially Phil Wilcox at the time of ICHS 10 um, and the industry associations. And this is my final slide. Actually, I'm uh, sitting in Basel um, in, in Switzerland and um, we have two companies here. On the right-hand side, you see the campus of Novartis where I'm typically working, but on the lower left-hand side, you see a skyscraper, which has now a second uh, high-rise building. That's Roche actually, the competitor. Um, but this, the center of the city is Basel with a nice um, silhouette and the river Rhine. And it's in the uh, triangle of Germany, France, and Switzerland. Um, and my talk is currently given from Germany. So uh, this is my, my last slide and I'm welcoming any questions. And thank you, thank you for the invitation uh, to join you virtually uh, in Seoul.